Hello there and welcome to the Audio Epics podcast for the premiere of the 10th episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay. You might have noticed with the last episode that the easygoing holiday feel, uh, or the, you know, the led back treasure hunting vibe is, well, it's kind of going away now and things are getting a bit more serious. With the 10th episode, we have three chapters planned out for you. The others, The Sunrise and The Revenge. Listen on if you want to find out how the story goes on. And thank you so much for your likes, comments and shares, and for your reviews on Amazon and Goodreads. Both of those are very useful and very helpful to us. After this episode, there will be two more, and then it's back to our storytelling podcasts while we work on The Wizard of the Woods and some other short story that we won't reveal the title of just yet. Maybe you'll find out more in the next intros or outros. We did a poll on YouTube as to what we should do when we reached 5,000 subscribers, and writing a new short story and creating another audiobook won most of the votes. We are planning to do at least one of the other suggestions as well. We'll tell you more about that in due time. But as you might have read on social media, we're there already. We've reached 5k subscribers. In fact, there are 5,007 now. And we want to thank you all so much for subscribing to our channel. Our 5,000th subscriber is Laurent Verhoeven, who is in fact my boss and friend in the law firm where I work in the library. He noticed we had 4,999 and he wasn't subscribed yet, so he quickly claimed that 5,000th subscriber position. We're officially sending him all of the downloads of our stories, but he's read most of them. But now maybe he'll listen to the audiobooks as well. Since we actually know the 5,000th subscriber personally, and we don't want to be biased or anything, we decided to give the 5,001st subscriber the same rewards. And this is... Shake Your Ass. I'm assuming that is a nickname. If you recognize your nickname, send us an email. You'll find the email address in the comments section. We'll transfer you all of our audiobooks and yes, that includes the extended edition of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay. We've already mentioned Silver Compass Maps, who's actually creating a map of Ruda at the moment. Make sure to look him up online. You can find the Patreon and Instagram link in the description. Also, check out Mike Soldano's novels if you're hungry for more fantasy, as we're nearing the end of this epic treasure hunt. The link tree of At The Writing Mage is in the description. Also, find us on Patreon. I discovered AI artwork today. Um, I discovered that it exists, and when I saw it, it kind of saddened me a little. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, voiceover software has also hit the voiceover industry quite hard, even though a monkey could really tell the difference between a robot and a real voice actor. But as long as enough people support arts, crafts, entertainment through platforms like Patreon, we'll have nothing to worry about, since people will always be able to recognize a real painting or an original dramatized audiobook from an audio-generated one. Even the smallest amount can help us pay for software, the use of sound effects and music, and as a patron, you can make suggestions about which improvements you think we should make as well. That is patreon.com slash audioepics. Tiers start from $1 onward, and many include merchandise. Don't forget to subscribe, even though we're over 5,000 now. Since it pre-tested and approved by more than 5,000 people before you, it should be safe to click that subscribe button and that notification bell. I hope you're on the edge of your seat by now, and you've made yourself a nice hot beverage with a tasty piece of Belgian chocolate, so you can find out who or what is on the black ship in the 10th episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay. The Others Ludlove had never felt so exhausted. But concern was growing in his heart over the fate of the Teresia's captain and crew. If the men on the other ship were pirates, there was a reasonable possibility Captain Brokelhoff and the others had already been killed. When at last they emerged out of the dense foliage, 
and arrived on the beach of the island, somewhere northwest to the location of their ship, the sun was setting right in front of them. The sky was clear and everything was basking in the warm, soothing light of dusk. Everyone virtually collapsed on the soft sand, too exhausted even to speak much anymore. They all understood they could no longer go on. The Teresia and her crew would have to wait until the next day. Despite all that had happened, Ludlow felt at peace as he lay on the beach amidst his friends. He watched the sun sink beneath the horizon in a dazzling display of color and listened to the gentle lapping of the waves. Before he could even summon the energy to think back on their journey so far, he had already fallen asleep. Wake up, sleepyheads! shouted a cheerful voice in a flatlandish accent. Ludlow stifled a groan and slowly emerged from his position. His eyes were still tired, but his body felt more alive than it had. Gustav was standing right next to him, already wearing his backpack. Everyone else reacted in much the same way Ludlow had. Dutiful, but with little enthusiasm. Ludlow got up and washed his face with clear ocean water. What a way to wake up, eh? Gossie! Gustav exclaimed. The sea, the wind! Today we travel south along this beach until we reach the Teresia and the other ship. If both are still moored there, Tomgard said. It will not be very far anymore, I think. Do you think we have much to fear from them? Alvarado asked. The other ship, I mean. They might be friendly, actually, Tomgard suggested. I just thought of this. I wouldn't put it past Lord Adomir to send another ship directly from Wainvu to follow us and provide aid, or even to evaluate our results. Chappelle suddenly looked rather nervous. I wouldn't assume that, Ludlow said. That would mean he had notified some allies from Wainvu from the start, or they sent others over the mainland of Goldor. The alternative is that they're pirates. I don't know which I prefer, Chappelle admitted. We will proceed with caution, Tomgard said. We'll stay out of sight as long as possible and won't approach the ship all at once. There isn't much more we can do. We do eventually all have to get back to the Teresia. Ludlow agreed. He had been pleasantly surprised by Tomgard's leadership so far. Perhaps he was the sort of man who flourished in such a role. But Ludlow had the impression there was more to it. It seemed like von Baumeister had held sway over him in some way that was less than healthy. Freed from his influence, Tormgard had regained a degree of confidence that Ludlow had never seen in him before. Tormgard was a witch hunter again, and Ludlow could see it. He was not the only one. The others found it easy to obey their new leader's commands as well, despite everything that had occurred earlier in their journey. Eventually, as the day grew brighter and warmer, the two ships became visible in the distance. The group quickly hid in the nearby jungle. Gustav took out his spyglass. Oh, he said. Then he looked at Ludlow. Recognize it? Warily, Ludlow took over the spyglass and peered through. The ship next to the Teresia was entirely black. There was no flag. The ones who have been following us since Lanvu, Ludlow grunted. Tomgard muttered a curse oh, it's bloody as Gustav took over the spyglass from Ludlow once more. The deck looks empty, the Flatlander said as he peered again through the item. But there is a gangplank between the two ships and there is a rope ladder out in the water. It looks like they're expecting us to climb back on board. Should we just approach the ship then and get on board? Ludlow asked, feeling rather apprehensive about the situation. We could do that, Gustav said. The rowing boats we used are still on the beach. 
Isn't it a bit risky to expose ourselves like that? Alvarado wondered aloud. We don't know who these newcomers are. We can't hide forever, Alvarado, Tomgard said. We need to get back to the ship. Just be prepared for a fight, if it comes to that. Rudolf was grateful he had Federhel's pistol with him now. I think it's best if I go out alone at first, Tomgard suggested. I will come with you, Rudolf said. Tomgard shrugged and stepped out of the jungle. Rudolf following closely behind. When they neared the two rowboats, they saw a curious sight. Further inland, on the edge between the beach and the jungle, was a third boat that had been dragged ashore. It lay on its side, and there was a man sitting in its shade beside the blackened remains of a campfire. When he saw Ludlov and Tuomgard arrive, the man immediately veered up and came running towards them. Now Ludlov could see that it was Ard, smiling broadly. When their paths met, the Flatlander hugged Tuomgard and Ludlov in a tight embrace. You have survived! Praised be the goddess! How was the treasure hunt? Extremely successful, as you can see, Tomgard said gloomily. Ard looked disappointed. You didn't find anything? We think we did, but we'll talk about it when we're back on board. Ard nodded, but then he got a very concerned look on his face. Are you two all that's left? Ludlov glanced at Tomgard, who gave a barely noticeable nod in approval. No, the others are nearby. Ludlov said. We didn't want to approach all at once, considering there's another ship here. He took out his spyglass to check on the ship once more. Oh, that! Ard said with a smile. Don't worry. I think you will get along with these newcomers. They are friends of Seven Peaks. Ludlov gazed at the Theresia and saw Captain Brokelhoff, waving enthusiastically in their direction. Hmm. It seems you were right, Tomgard. Ludlov admitted. The witch hunter order sent another ship. Tomgard sighed. <sighs> I don't know whether I'm relieved or annoyed. The most dangerous part of the mission is probably behind us now. If they wanted to send help, they could have done it sooner. I don't think it's help, Ludlov said. I think they've come to check on us. Well, it is help as well, Ard said. They sent me with this extra rowboat thinking you'd have a treasure chest with you. Tomgard sighed. <sighs> Go get the others, Ludlov. Ludlov made his way back to the jungle. That was odd! Gustav exclaimed enthusiastically. Yes, he came to bring an extra rowboat for us, Ludlov said. Then he looked Chappelle in the eye. We've got friendly company, apparently, he told her. They are allies of Seven Peaks, probably sent by Lord Edomir for our evaluation. Her eyes grew wide with fear, but she tried to maintain her composure. Ludlov had meant the evaluation of the initiates, but he should have realized Chappelle was anxious about having to explain what had happened to their master. What will you do? He asked softly. Well, I can't stay here on an uninhabited island, can I? I suppose... It's better to face their judgment. Blessed Zelenheim laid a hand on Chappelle's shoulder. Tomgard has promised to defend you, she said. We are all witnesses. Master von Baumeister had lost the faculty of reason and had become a threat to us all. You saved our lives. That is the whole truth of it, Alvarado confirmed. Chappelle took Zelenheim's hand in gratitude. Then she looked at Ludlov. I will come. They all emerged onto the beach. Ard laughed and took each of them in an embrace. He also kissed the women and Alvarado. I know you men of the South like that sort of thing, he said. Alvarado looked a bit bewildered. Ard put his hands on his hips and gave the group an appraising look. Well, time to go, I suppose, he said. But where are the master and that younger fellow? They didn't make it, Tomgard replied somberly. I'm sorry, Ard said. You must have gone through a lot of hardship out there.
all six remaining treasure hunters fit into the single rowing boat with Ard. But Gustav was forced to put his backpack on his lap, which looked far from comfortable to Rudlov. He and Alvarado assisted Ard with the rowing, and Rudlov felt a strange sense of melancholy as he watched the beach of Garadoso growing smaller. He had expected to feel relieved at the prospect of returning to the civilized world, but he felt like he had left something of himself on that island. Perhaps it was simply the final farewell to Federhel, and even von Baumeister, that was confusing his spirit. Tomgard was still clutching his eye. The moist heat on the island had caused the bandage to come loose again. Gustav offered him a large handkerchief that he reluctantly accepted. Don't worry, I barely used it, Gustav said when Tomgard tied it around his head to cover up his eye wound. The rowboat held still at the rope ladder hanging from the Theresia's hull. Ard was the first to climb it, with Ludlow following closely behind. When he arrived on deck, Ludlov was surprised to see that there was no one else there. Where is everyone? he asked Ard, who shrugged. Perhaps they're all below deck? That's odd. I thought Captain Brokolov was waving at us earlier. They might still be on the other ship to transfer some supplies. I suppose we'll see when everyone is on board, Ard said reassuringly. Alvarado came next followed by Gustav, Chapelle, Blessed Zelenheim, and finally Tormgard. They all wondered about the abandoned deck as well. Odd, Captain Brokolov told me to get you. He was so eager to welcome you back and now he's nowhere to be seen, Ard said. Odd indeed, Tormgard said. Let's go below deck and find out. Ludlov wasn't looking forward to meeting other witch hunters or perhaps other high-ranking officers sent by Adomir, maybe even members of the Inquisitio Internis, but the thought of sleeping in his cabin again that night did improve his mood. As soon as they had arrived in the hold, Rudlov knew something was wrong. Beyond the stairs it was utterly dark, but the place smelled of sweat, leather and strong drink. <laughs> Weapons were drawn, and rough voices were chuckling viciously in the gloom. Instinctively, Ludlov reached for his rapier, but then a deep voice came from the dark. It spoke in a Goldorian accent. You are surrounded by twenty of us. If you draw your weapons, this will be a very short and very bloody encounter. And I don't feel like cleaning up this place. <laughs> By the grim laughter that emerged from all around them, Ludlov could tell this man was not lying. Ard! shouted the voice. Something was thrown to the stairs in Ard's direction. When he caught it, Ludlov saw that it was a weapons belt with a sheathed sword. Ah! Finally! Reunited! Ard said with a grin. He kissed the sword before putting on the belt. You're a traitor! Gustav cried out. Mau je kopjes! Ard replied in Flatlandish. He sounded annoyed. Raise your arms and give up your weapons! The deep voice commanded. Ludlov sighed and obeyed, not knowing what the others would do. But he knew this was not a fight they could win. As their weapons were being taken from them, several lanterns were lit around them revealing the enemy. Right in front of Ludlov stood a man dressed in Captain Brokolhoff's clothes. His face was stubbly and scarred and bore no resemblance to that of the Theresia's true captain. <laughs> Remember me? He snickered. Then he waved in exactly the same manner as he had done on the deck earlier. Out of the way, Yip, said the deeper voice Ludlov had heard earlier. Before Yip had a chance to react, he was already being shoved aside, and in his place appeared the owner of the voice. He was a relatively short man, but he had an air of authority in the way he moved. He wore a black coat with copper buttons and epaulets with gold tassels on his shoulders. His face carried the most arrogant and sadistic-looking expression Ludlov had ever seen, which seemed to be its permanent state. Above his arched eyebrows, 
was perched a huge bicorn hat. Let me guess, you're a pirate captain, Tomgard quipped. Cotillac, he introduced himself. Well met, monsieur. Where's the Tarija's crew? Tomgard demanded. Immediately, Cotignac slapped the witch hunter hard across the face. You will have some manners when you address your captain! Then he turned and addressed his crew. Throw them in the brig. I have not the patience for them now. Captain Brokoff! Where is he? Tomgard shouted again. You will see soon enough, Cotignac <laughs> said with a mocking little laugh. Then Rudloff felt a pistol being shoved into his back. Into the brig with you, mate, said a rough voice behind him. Their weapons, coats and hats were taken and they were forced to make their way to the lower deck, where the brig was located. Behind a wooden door was a space just big enough for about ten men to stand in, two-thirds of which was behind bars. They were all shoved behind the bars into a small space, men and women alike. There was one other man who was already there, lying in a corner, turning his face away when they entered. Have a happy reunion, <laughs> said one of the pirates <laughs> as he closed the iron gate. Then their captors left and closed the wooden door, leaving them alone. Raucous laughter erupted from behind the door. The only light now came from a single lantern dangling from the ceiling on the other side of the bars. Most of the prisoners found a place to sit down. Only Ludlow and Chappelle remained standing, both leaning against the bars as they faced their fellow captives. The man in the corner, emaciated and dressed in rags, bowed his head. Captain Brugelhoff? Ludlow said carefully, not because he recognized him, but only in the hope that their former captain was still alive. <laughs> the wretched man sobbed and sniffed. I don't want you to see me like this, he croaked. What happened? Alvarado asked, who was sitting next to the captain. <laughs> it was odd. He offered to prepare food for us. Some traditional flatlandish dish. It was poison. Many just died in their sleep. They were the lucky ones. When we woke up, Cotignac and his men were already here. You must have notified them some way or another. Throats were slit. Hearts were pierced. More men who would never see the sunrise. He paused, gathering his strength to continue the tale. They stripped me out of my clothes. They put me in these rags to shame me. Then this Cotignac began to grill me about your mission. He already seemed to have learned the basic information, probably from, from Ad. There wasn't much more I could tell. It didn't matter. Every time I couldn't answer a question. They, they killed one of my men. Until it was just me. Ludlow couldn't help thinking about all the friendly crew members on the Teresia. Then he thought of Pete and Naila. And his chest hurt. As if he'd just swallowed a big rock. He recited a quick silent prayer for all those lost souls. I alone. The last survivor. I don't know why they kept me, Captain Brokelhoff mused aloud. The door opened again. Because of Crankor, you idiot, said Ard, as he ambled in, carrying a half-empty bottle of Goldorian wine in his hand. Three other pirates followed him, all carrying malicious smiles on their faces. If we kill you, he might come back and test the heart of our current captain, Ard explained. Don't know how that would end, so... <laughs> he took a big swig from the bottle. <coughs> this is my third fill. You Goldorians sure know how to make wine, he said, grinning at Chappelle. 
You pirates sure don't know how to drink it. She shot back. Ard approached slowly. I just love a spirited woman. Even more than I love a spirited drink, I must say. Chappelle stood facing him from behind the bars, her expression cold as steel. You make me sick to my stomach, you detestable salaud. She broke into Goldorian as she cursed him. Je te déteste. Un jour tu vas payer pour tout ce que tu as fait. No, no, Ard said, closing the distance between them and reaching between the bars to take a strand of her golden hair, letting it run through his fingers. What a beautiful language you have. Perhaps I should ask the captain to translate what you just said to me. But I'm sure it was very romantic. The other man chuckled darkly. <laughs> you don't intimidate me, you fool. Chappelle hissed. Good. One less thing to stand in the way of our romance. Ard said, causing Alvarado to rise up. Do not touch her, he grunted. Immediately the other pirates drew their weapons and raised them, forcing Alvarado to back down. Why? Is she yours? Ard asked innocently. Then he grinned. I didn't think so. You witch hunters don't engage in such activities, I thought. The traitor turned to Chappelle again. I've had my eye on you from the beginning, Blondie. While well, you still thought I was a poor castaway, I was already making plans about what I'd do to you once you got off the island. I must say, it's quite a relief to me that you made it back in one piece. Not that several injuries have held me back in the past, but now I suppose, my dear... <laughs> Suddenly he tugged at her hair and pulled her face hard against the bars. He drank the last remains of the wine, pushed the empty bottle into the hands of one of his comrades, and drew a knife from his belt. That means you're mine. Let me mark you as such. His gaze went over her left cheek, pausing a moment on the cut left by one of the undead in the temple. Chappelle refused to scream as he turned her head and carved something into her right cheek. But she couldn't keep herself from groaning in pain. Ludlov watched in agony, unable to act, lest he would end up on the sharp end of a blade. Then Ard let her go. I'll come back for you when I'm sober. Chappelle fell back into the brig, clutching her bleeding cheek. Come on, men, Ard said to the other pirates. Let's take a look at that huge backpack my countryman took with him. I've been wondering from the start what in Ruda he was carrying. As they left, Blessed Zelenheim knelt beside Chappelle. Let me see, child. Is it bad? Ludlov saw Chappelle lift a trembling hand from her cheek, revealing a blood-stained scar, shaped like a heart. The Sunrise It was impossible to tell what the time was. Only the small lantern brought some light into the room, so they could at least see each other in the dark. Everyone looked demoralized. In that moment, Ludlov's hatred for Ard threatened to overshadow any other feelings he harbored. He was not even sure if he was hungry. Chappelle sat with her back to the hull of the ship, holding a bloodied piece of cloth against her cheek. It had come from the hem of the priestess's long flowing skirt, which had now turned into a tattered rag. Ludlov sat down next to Chappelle. I wish I could have done something, he said, feeling like he needed to apologize. There is nothing you could have done, except get yourself killed, Chappelle replied. There was bitterness in her voice. We will make him pay, Alvarado said. Yes, we will, she said. And there will be no escape for him. Suddenly, her eyes lifted up and she fumbled in one of her sleeves. She took out the small hidden knife and tried to pick the lock of the barred door. After a while she gave up and slid the thing back into the leather bracer she had found in the temple. It was apparently useless for lockpicking, 
but it might still come in handy afterwards. Ludlov had expected Gustav to tell them he was an expert at that sort of thing and to offer his assistance to Chappelle, but he hadn't. The Flatlander, who had been quiet longer than they had ever known him to be, bowed his head. How can this be? he asked in an agonized whimper. I thought I'd found a friend. He's just a masterful manipulator, Tomgard said, just like our master was. Do you mean von Baumeister? Captain Brokelhoff asked in surprise. What happened to him? He died, was all Tomgard divulged. Ludlow had been wondering about Tomgard's attitude to von Baumeister and how it had changed so drastically. I used to think that Master von Baumeister was a great man, Tomgard said. Ruthlessly devoted, utterly committed to the causes of the Order. In truth, he was just devoted and committed to his own pride. And so was I. The more I followed him, the more I became like him. I'm sorry, all of you, for how I acted. I wish I could have stopped what he did, but I never expected him to actually... He swallowed hard. For what it's worth, that was the wake-up call I needed. It takes guts to lead, but to blindly follow whoever puts himself in that position, that's easy. He fell silent for a while. Ludlow could only imagine what it would be like to admire someone so much and see them fall so low. It's not your fault for liking Ad and vouching for him, Gustav. You could not have known, Tomgard continued. Well, Gustav said, sighing deeply. I never thought it was my fault, but thanks anyway. He smiled earnestly. Can I finally ask you something? All of you? Brokelhoff said. Everyone looked at him. What did you end up finding on the island? You don't have the treasure with you, unless it's in Gustav's backpack. So where is it? We believe it's in Boneyard Bay, Ludlow said. What? Do you mean to say that all you found here was yet another clue? How long will this continue? Until the treasure is found, Tomgard said, barely managing to keep the desperation out of his tone of voice. We will do what we set out to do. But what will we tell the pirates? Ludlow asked. I will think of something, Tomgard said. We could tell them we buried the treasure somewhere in Garadoso. Chappelle suggested. That ought to keep them busy for a while. Aye, Tomgard conceded. But then they'll return, and we'll still be here on the ship. Where is Federhel? Brokelhoff asked. He's usually quite insightful. He fell, Ludlow said gloomily. Before Brokelhoff could respond, the door opened again, and Cotignac entered. He was alone, and carried the small box containing the tips of Kulmaron's crown under his arm. He opened the box and held out one of the golden items for the prisoners to see. Pretty enough, these things. But somehow, I do not think that this is the treasure. He glared at them menacingly. I demand answers. Where is the real treasure? Did you bury it on the island? If we did, you'd have a problem, Gustav bluffed, since I don't think Crankor will let you anywhere near the island. I would simply pressure you until you do my will and dig up the treasure for me. A few pulled fingernails here, or some burn marks there. It should persuade even a witch hunter. I understand your order is no stranger to such methods. Although, being on the receiving end is another matter, no? J'ai pas peur de toi, Chappelle said in Goldorian. Peut-être pas encore, mais tout ça va changer, chérie, Cotignac replied with a grin. There was no treasure on the island, Tomgard said. But we found clues to the real location. Tomgard, no, Ludlow warned. But it was too late. 
Good. You have a sensible leader, Cotignac said as he put the golden item back in the box and closed the lid. I may yet spare you for now. He walked over to where Tormgard was sitting. Where is this location? Ludlov looked at Tormgard with wide eyes as the witch hunter agonized over his next words. Bonyard Bay, he said eventually. That's where the real treasure is. Tormgard, why? Ludlov uttered. Do you want to betray our entire quest? Alvarado added. I don't want to see any more of you dead, Tomgard said. Again, sensible man, Cotignac said with a nod and a smile. You will lead us to this place and solve the riddle for us. And in the meantime, I will keep these... He tapped the box. Safely stored on this ship. What about your ship? Brokelhoff asked, provoking a casual shrug from the pirate leader. Yours is bigger, has more cannons, and a pretty naked lady on the front. We'll take this one. He gave one final nod to Tormgard. Thank you, Witch Hunter. I think we might get along after all. Then he left. Tormgard, how could you tell him that? Chappelle asked when she was sure they were no longer being overheard. I only told him about Boonyard Bay, Tomgard defended himself. That's where we need to get to, isn't it? I didn't see anything about Sintrasha's statue. We might still trick him into thinking it's in some cave by the beach. In fact, I believe there is one at the northern side at the bay that would qualify. That's right, Gustav said in a loud voice. Skullcrest Cave, very well known to pirates. I don't know if they would believe it, but this journey has been full of secret passageways and trapdoors and so on, so why wouldn't there be one over there as well? At least this way, we'll be headed in the right direction, Tomgard went on. Actually, that makes a lot of sense, Chappelle admitted. She began to smile, but her cheek clearly hurt when she did so. The wound inflicted by the undead creature on her other cheek was slowly healing. But Ard's heart-shaped carving would probably leave a permanent scar. Ludlove felt sorry for her, but refrained from showing it, knowing it would only make things worse. Well, at least the mystery of the black ship is solved, Alvarado said in a vain effort to raise their spirits. Cotignac. I should have known, Captain Brokelhoff muttered darkly. It sounds like you know him, Ludlov said. Only by reputation. All he cares about is gold and jewels, they say. There is no room for anything else in his heart. He travels all along the coasts of the northern continent, always changing his ship, never flying the pirate flag. Art's castaway routine was the sort of honorless trick only Cotignac would use. I should have known. He sighed, closed his eyes, and rested his head against the wood behind him. Sleep came slow, mostly because Ludlov was ravenous. So was Alvarado, who wouldn't stop talking about it. I wonder what pirate meat tastes like. Ludlov heard the Esclavian mutter in the dark after the lantern had fizzled out. It became quiet after that. When at last sleep took him, Ludlov dreamed about Ard's head on a silver platter. The door flew open, startling Ludlov out of his slumbers. Several men entered. Sunrise, friends! Ard said cheerfully. He was wearing a witch hunter hat that was clearly too small for his big head. Upon closer inspection, Ludlov realized that it was Chappelle's. You can see it in here, but it's actually morning, and your presence is requested on deck. Blades and pistols were drawn, signifying there would be no heroics on the prisoner's part. Then the iron gate of the brig was opened, and Ludlov was dragged out by two of the pirates. 
They shoved him against the bars and harshly began to tie his hands on his back in a firm knot. The others were treated the same way. When they arrived on deck, Rudloff saw that the Teresia was already sailing away from the island. He had no idea how far they had traveled, since the island had to be somewhere behind them, hidden by the quarterdeck and the poop. All he could see beyond the railings of the ship was an endless sea under a warm, slowly brightening sunrise. The prisoners were made to stand with their backs to the captain's quarters, guarded by two of the fiercest-looking ruffians. Ard ambled along the deck, taking a deep breath. These hats are nice, but this one is a bit small for me, he said, tugging at the brim. Why did you bring us here? Tomgard asked. If you mean to kill us, just get it over with. Don't you remember last night's conversation with our captain? Ard asked, sounding almost polite. We need at least some of you to lead us to the treasure. No, we just want to make clear to you who is in charge here. Then the door to the captain quarters beside them opened and Kotinyak emerged. He walked with his head held high and his hands clasped behind his back, carefully taking in the sight of his prisoners. In particular, he gave Turmgard a long, appraising gaze. I heard from Ad that your master from Baumeister did not make it. Did he get himself killed trying to get to the treasure? He asked eventually. Master von Baumeister? Aye, he's dead. Why does it matter to you? You don't even know him. It does matter, at least a little bit. And yes, I did know him. Turmgard, is that it? How did you know him? Turmgard asked, in utter shock. Von Baumeister and I were business associates, that is all. Kotinyak told Turmgard. The arrangement was to follow you from a distance, for you to find the treasure, and for us to take it from you. All except for a black chest which he was very keen on keeping himself for some reason. He also mentioned a small item, some piece of jewelry with magical properties. That was to be my reward! Gustav cried out. Right. The shopkeeper. Kotinyak smiled. He told me about you and how much you wanted that thing. He specifically wanted you not to have it simply because he found you so annoying. This doesn't make sense. Why would he want the treasure to be stolen by pirates? Alvarado wondered aloud. Ah, uh, he was to get his share, of course. Quite a bit more than he would have received from the mayor of Seven Peaks or the witch hunter order, I'm quite sure. And he honestly believed you would hold up your end of the bargain? Brokelhoff scoffed. Von Baumeister was more stupid than I thought. He was not stupid. Kotinyak admitted. He thought he had leverage. My brother is being held in Seven Peaks on charges of necromancy. He would be freed afterwards. Bad luck for your brother then, Tomgard said, because no one else is going to free him. Now he will burn at the stake, Kotinyak shrugged. Good riddance. I could never stand him. I was never going to give von Baumeister his share. <laughs> what did you think? but his greed blinded him into believing I cared. He laughed, <laughs> causing some of the other pirates to join in. Anyway, it all worked out even more beautifully this way. Now I don't have to deal with this odious man ever again. And I have you find people to guide me to the treasure. Which brings me to the real question. What are those golden corns? What is their function? They're just some gold we found on the island, nothing more, Tomgard lied. We were disappointed when we didn't find the treasure, but at least we could take these along. That sounds reasonable, Kotinyak admitted. They're made of gold, after all. Still, that leaves us with the most important question. How do we find the treasure? Is there a lock, a key, an item we need? Tomgard shook his head. We're not sure, but the clues pointed us to a cave by the beach. We know the directions. 
Which cave? The one to the northwest of the town? Tomgard gave him a steely look. I won't tell. You'll need us to guide you. Cotignac nodded sagely. Then suddenly punched Tomgard hard in the stomach, causing him to double over and fall to his knees. I pulled the strings here! I believe... I believe it is that one, Tomgard managed to utter through the pain. Skullcrest Cave! He said excitedly. But then he frowned incredulously. We have been in that cave several times, as have many other treasure hunters, the captain said impatiently. We found nothing. If it is there, there has to be a hidden door or something, and a key to open it. Cotignac sighed in exasperation. Ah, fetch me the Flatlander's backpack, he told Yip, who immediately obeyed and went to the captain's quarters. When he came out, he was dragging along Gustav's massive luggage. That is my private property, Gustav protested. The pirates ignored him, and as soon as Yip had managed to drag the massive thing a bit closer, he began rummaging around in it. If there is a key, you must have it with you, since you're obviously the pack mule of the party. Perhaps we should throw every item overboard until we come to it. There will be time consuming, but... All right, all right, all right! It's the statuette, Gustav said. That was a smart move, Ludlow thought. It would move the pirates' attention away from the real key, the golden cones. Statuette? Cotignac repeated. Then Yip took the statue of Sintrasha out of the backpack and held it up. It was the real one. Cotignac took it and studied it carefully. Let us go to artistry. The sapphires themselves would fetch a nice prize. It is valuable, uh, this statuette. But how is it a key? I won't tell. I don't care what you do to me, Gustav said. It was both bold and strategic to keep the mystery alive, Ludlow thought. He admired Gustav's bravery. Uh, very well. Perhaps Tomgard will tell us then. Yip. Yip dragged Tomgard back on his feet and shoved him against the wooden wall of the captain's quarters. I won't talk either, Tomgard said, playing along with Gustav's game. We could slice off your fingertips one by one, Gottingak said. Perhaps that will change your mind. Ludlow saw Tomgard swallow, but he kept his expression impassive. Then the captain smiled. Or perhaps I underestimate the stoic nobility of your order. In that case, I think there may be a better solution. One that might improve the morale of my men as well. Ad, what do you think? Ad grinned and raised his eyebrows, as if he had anticipated this moment for a long time. The women here might console our lonesome sailors' hearts while the men reconsider telling us what they know about the treasure. Cotignac nodded thoughtfully. Yes, perhaps that would help. Let's start with the pretty Goldorian, said a tall, fat pirate, with red, sweaty skin and a forest of chest hair sticking out of its laced shirt. Chappelle winced. No, Uther, we will not be doing that, Ard said in an annoyed voice. She is mine, and I intend to take my time. You may start with the priestess. The priestess? The tall pirate repeated in shock. But isn't there... What? Ad retorted with a cocky smile. Are your religious sensibilities offended, Uther? Or is he just too old for your taste? Ludlow felt his blood boil at the men's lurid talk. Beside him, he saw Chappelle biting down so hard he could almost hear the gnashing of her teeth. Then he saw she was moving rhythmically, ever so slightly. At first he thought it was some involuntary nervous jitter, but then he looked down at her hands. She was still wearing the leather bracer. Of course, she was slicing the ropes. He felt relief washing over his heart. 
even though there was no way to know what would happen next. At the least, these men were in for a surprise. He quickly raised his head and looked ahead again. I hear it's bad luck to violate religious women, he heard Uta say. They're all religious, Ard countered. I mean, sisters and priestesses and the like, Ard shrugged. I had never taken you for the superstitious type. Does anyone else here agree with Uther? None of the pirates reacted beyond a simple shake of the head. They looked like they were getting impatient. All right then. We'll start with Blessed Salenheim. Ard pronounced her name as if it were inherently ridiculous, which infuriated Ludlow even more. Being the man who came up with the idea, and who got you all on board, and who enjoys the captain's special favor, I think I get to go first. He drew a dagger and swaggered over to the prisoners. So, blessed, tell me, are you one of those consecrated virgins, or do you have some experience? That might save us some time. Like a lightning flash, Chappelle's arm reached out and the tiny blade she had held hidden stuck into Ard's face, gashing it open. Blood sprayed out as he cried out in shock and pain and stumbled back onto the deck. As the witch hunter hat fell from his head, Chappelle intercepted it and returned it to her own head in a single fluent movement. We're even now, you scum. The two guards tried to grab Chappelle, but Tumgard threw his full weight onto them, causing them to tumble over on top of each other. This was Chappelle's chance to escape, and she ran up the steps to the quarterdeck. Get her back here! Ard shouted in fury and agony, holding his cheek with both hands, blood seeping lavishly between his fingers. <laughs> Cotignac suddenly burst out laughing, throwing back his head and smashing his palms together. Where will you go, chérie? <laughs> we are on the sea! Ludlow could see Chappelle standing beside the steering wheel, looking around furtively. I will die before I let any of you touch me! The pirate captain's laugh had turned into an amused smile. He knew she had nowhere to go. The two fallen pirates scrambled back up and ran up to the quarterdeck. Chappelle kicked them in the chest before they could reach the top. It slowed them down, but they were angry now and would not be stopped. Ludlow tried to run after her, but he was grappled by a strong pirate who held him in an inescapable grip. From where he now stood, Ludlow could see clearly what was happening on the quarterdeck, but he could do nothing to interfere. May the goddess punish you all! Chappelle cried out as the two pirates approached her. Out of options, she ran towards the railing and jumped down. Ludlow saw her dive down in a graceful arc and disappear. Then he heard the splash as she landed in the sea. With renewed strength, born of panic, he wrested himself free from the pirate's grip and ran towards the railing, quickly scanning the water. But all he saw was a witch hunter hat floating on the waves. Then the strong man grabbed him once more and returned him to his original position by the captain's quarters. You should have killed her, you fools! Shoot into the water! Hart shouted, <laughs> but Cotignac restrained him with his hand, <laughs> chuckling. <laughs> Don't waste your bullets, man. Even if she were a mermaid, it would take her more than a day to swim back to Garadoso. <laughs> and who is going to help her there? Ludlow felt his heart sink as he heard those words, knowing Cotignac spoke the truth. This is good news for me, actually. The captain continued. Now you men can put your lustful thoughts aside and focus on the treasure. There is still the priestess. Ard muttered darkly from the railing where he was standing. Ludlow wished he could push him over the edge. No! Cotignac said emphatically. I actually find rape to be most distasteful. I only allowed for it because I thought it might persuade these men to give us some more information and perhaps remove some of the tension in this crew. The witch hunter wench has convinced me it's not worth it. Besides... He eyed Blessed Salenheim warily. 
I don't know much about this woman's goddess, but I don't want any divine wrath to come over our new ship. You will leave her alone. You will find out how to use this key in due time anyway. If our guests won't tell us, we will find out ourselves. Put them back in the brig. The Revenge Back in the brig, they were finally given something to eat. It was only a bland bowl of gruel and some moldy bread, but it would keep them alive. Despite his urgent need for sustenance, Ludlow found himself barely able to swallow down anything, his mind still reeling after Chappelle's sudden disappearance. Chappelle escaped! Gustave said enthusiastically, when at last he suspected there were no pirates on the other side of the door. Maybe we could as well, once we get to Boneyard Bay. Ludlow shook his head and sighed. She escaped one terrible fate, but stumbled into another, he said gloomily. Chappelle is gone. You don't know that, Alvarado protested. She might be found by another ship or make her way to some desert island. Ludlow couldn't bear to answer him, knowing his friend was deluding himself. He kept looking at the empty space where Chappelle had been sitting the night before, and whenever he did so, it felt like his heart was chained to some massive rock, sinking to the bottom of the ocean. She had disappeared so suddenly. What would happen to her now? He couldn't bear the thought of Chappelle using up every last ounce of strength she had in her muscles to swim back to shore, only to find herself unable to reach Garadoso and drown somewhere, alone and unnoticed. Or perhaps the blood of her wounded face would draw the attention of some sharks and that would be the end. He didn't know which was worse, but he couldn't think of a happier outcome. Only a miracle would save her, and those Ludlow knew to be very rare. He simply couldn't delude himself, as comforting as it would have been to do so. He had to face the truth. Chappelle was gone, and they would never see her again. The only consolation he had was the goddess. He closed his eyes and said a prayer for Chappelle's soul. Blessed Zelenheim joined in, then Alvarado, Tomgard, and at last Gustav. Only then did the tears flow freely among them. The journey felt like it lasted for a thousand years, and each day was the same. They would sleep in the same miserable brig, be fed with the same miserable food, and then put to the same miserable chores every day, swabbing the deck, cleaning up after the pirates or preparing their food. By the time they were getting close to Podia, they had started to come up with a plan to escape while the Teresia lay anchored there. Unfortunately, Captain Cotignac had foreseen something like that and kept them locked up in the brig throughout their entire stay in the harbour, placing a watchman at their door for additional security. The pirates only stayed in the southernmost city for a day before moving on again. Too eager to find the fabled treasure of Boneyard Bay to waste any more time. When the ship was on her way again, Cotignac eased the prisoners' restrictions once more and they were put to work again. Ard was constantly looking at them from a distance, either grinning in pleasure at their humiliation or sneering in contempt. His face was continually framed by a bandage, which made him look less than threatening. It's not exactly a good look for a pirate, Gustav commented one day while he and Ludlow were scrubbing the deck. Ard was pacing around, twirling a knife, throwing it up and always catching it again by the handle. 
I thought they liked to display their scars proudly, Ludloff said. Some do, Gustav said, as if he knew everything about pirates. Maybe he did, for all Ludloff knew. Most seek out some kind of replacement or covering when they lose a part of their body. You mean eye patches? Things like that, Ludloff said, grunting as he forced himself to remove a particularly <clears throat> stubborn stain. He had no idea why he did his genuine best to keep the ship clean. Perhaps it was because he would not give these pirates the satisfaction of seeing his humiliation. Or perhaps he simply wished to honor the ship that had brought them so far along on this journey. In the end, he thought he did it for Captain Brokohov. Rudloff saw the pain in the man's eyes every day. He had lost almost everything. This ship was all he had left in the world even if she was no longer under his command. Actually, I once knew a former pirate who sailed with me, Gustav said. He had really gone all out. I mean, really. He had two eye patches, each hand replaced by a hook and two peg legs. Impressive, Ludlow said wryly. What had happened to him? A malfunctioning cannon or a shark attack? Gustav shrugged. Maybe boat? I don't know. He also wore an earring on each ear and kept a parrot on each shoulder just to balance things out. Come to think of it, he was probably the most symmetrical pirate I've ever seen. He didn't do much around the ship though. Well, there wasn't much he could do. What was his name? Ludlow asked. Simon, Gustav said. So I always refer to him as Simon the Symmetrical. <laughs> Ludlow found himself <laughs> chuckling softly, despite how miserable he was. He was grateful to at least have Gustav's nonsense around. That night, Captain Brokelhoff talked to them in the brig. I've been inside my old quarters today, he said. Kotinyak summoned me there just to rub it in, I think. The place hasn't changed much, but I've seen something interesting. All of our gear is stored in there, not just Gustav's backpack. If only we could find some way to get hold of it as we escape, Alvarado said, but he couldn't think of any way to achieve that, and neither could Ludlov. I pray to the goddess the in the out, said Blessed Zelenheim. I believe she will not forsake us. Ludlov was quiet. He wanted to believe her, but they had already lost so much in such a short span of time he simply didn't dare to hope anymore. The next day, they began to see other ships in the distance, indicating they were nearing another harbor. Bunyad Bay is near. Tomorrow, we will be there, they overheard Kotignac say. I can almost smell the gold. That night, Ludlow and the other prisoners were quiet. They knew they had failed to come up with a workable plan. The next day, they would simply have to lead their captors through the jungles north of the town and somehow find a way to shake them off, get their gear back and travel south to the cliff where the statue stood. We should at least have some sort of sign, Ludlow suggested. When you give us the sign, Tom God, that means it's time for us to run. Blisters, Gustav said absent-mindedly, looking at his hands. That's a good one, Alvarado said. Then he turned to Tomgard. When you say the word blisters, it's time for us to make a run for it. Tomgard nodded solemnly. Blisters that will be. He seemed in better spirits. His eye was no longer bandaged and beginning to heal. He could already open it to a slit and had told everyone he was able to make out rough shapes again on that side. Evening became night and darkness fell. I think I'm too tired even to dream, Gustav muttered shortly before he started to snore loudly. It didn't bother Ludlow, who closed his eyes as well and quickly fell into a dreamless sleep.
Some time later, Ludlov was shaken out of his slumbers when the wooden door to the brig opened and Art entered, carrying a lantern. Yip and two other pirates were behind him. Time to bind your hands again. You're going outside, Art said. Ever since Chappelle had repaid him for her scar, he had been considerably less cheerful and more terse when he addressed the prisoners. Ludlov underwent the now familiar hand-binding routine patiently, as did the others. Everyone still looked tired, even the pirates. When they arrived on deck, Ludlov saw that it was still night. We've sighted land, Ard explained. The shore of Isklavia is nearby. Come. He opened the door to the captain's quarters and gestured for the prisoners to follow him inside. The other pirates remained outside to guard the door. When they entered, Gottignac was standing at the window, apparently looking outside even though it was too dark to see much. He was probably just looking at his own reflection, Ludlow thought. Then his gaze shifted and he saw Gustav's enormous backpack in a corner next to a large chest which probably contained their weapons, coats, and Tormgard's hat. Gottignac turned from the window and smiled. So, here we are, near the final stretch of our journey, he said. When we arrive, you will become our guides. But not all of you. His gaze passed over each of the prisoners. One at least must remain here to make sure you don't try to run away. Ludlow had already feared this might happen. Another obstacle was about to be added to the already insurmountable pile. Leave the priestess here, Ard said. She probably won't be of much use in that cave. Cotignac shook his head. You can be devious, Ard, but sometimes you really are an imbecile. Why do you think they took our long in the first place? Ard shrugged. To bless the ship or something, I don't know. To lift the curse, let me rest upon the gold, you fool, Gottignac said, which didn't quite impress Ard. Ludlow guessed the flatlandish pirate didn't believe in curses. Well, who would you leave here then? Ard asked. One of the initiates? The old captain? The shopkeeper? Obviously, Tormgard has to come. I want to take along the initiates as well, Gottignac said. As for the captain, I don't know. It would do him some good to get off this ship. He's become far too attached over the years, I think. No. I would say, keep Finster Dunkel on the Theresia. We won't need him in there. Just some of the contents of his luggage. Excuse me, but I'm actually very useful, Gustav protested. I know more about Boneyard Bay than any of these people. You don't get to have a say in this matter, friend. If Ad agrees, it's settled. Ad shrugged again. I still think we shouldn't take the priestess along, but if you disagree, Gus here will be fine as leverage. I think these idiots would actually come back for him. <laughs> it's not Gus, it's Gustav, the shopkeeper muttered. Very well then, Gottenjak said. We already know the location of the cave. On the beach, to the northwest of the town of Boneyard Bay. Once we're there, where do we need to go? Gottignac asked of his prisoners. We didn't find anything on our previous visit to that cave, so there must be some hidden doorway. I suppose we'll have to see, Tomgard replied with a shrug. It's not clear to us either. This entire journey has been a string of riddles. You're a villain, Gottignac, but you're smart. Perhaps you will be the one to figure this one out. Perhaps, Gottignac mused. We will see. Just don't play any tricks on us if you want to live. There is no need for desperate heroics. We will not kill you after you reveal your secrets. That wouldn't be the most profitable option to us. Just because Isclavia is no longer the Isle of Slaves doesn't mean I don't know of some places where a few good strong men like you would fetch a pretty price. In any case, you better get on to figuring out quickly how we get to this treasure. El Padre could be here any day for his annual visit to Governor Teramin. We didn't make this much haste at sea for nothing, you know. If we get the treasure for him, El Padre will reward us with all the privileges we want. 
Or even better, I might end up with more gold than the Pirate King himself, and you might actually be looking at the new Padre. <laughs> Ad scoffed with disdain. You'll have to get past his little pet first then. And you know very well it only obeys. Ludlov couldn't catch the rest of the sentence as he heard a sudden cry from outside. There were voices shouting, followed by the sound of many boots as men were running in all directions. For a moment, Ludlov thought he had been catapulted back in time to their encounter with Tubalba, as if their entire journey had been a dream. But then, Ad opened the door, and he saw Yip on deck. There's a sea serpent outside, Ad! And it's headed straight for this ship! Tubalba, Captain Brokohoff said. Tubalba, Katiyak repeated. The biggest sea serpent of them all? Why would you think that? Because we faced him already on our way here. And he's out for revenge, Brokohoff said. Kotonyak could only stare incredulously at him. How did you survive that? Don't ask me, Brokohoff said. Ludlov and Alvarado were the heroes in that encounter. And Gustav too. Gustav? Kotonyak repeated in even greater disbelief. Yes, me. I have my uses, you know, the shopkeeper grumbled. Of course, if you actually want me to help out now, I'll be needing my backpack. <laughs> Cotignac laughed bitterly, but his mirth abruptly ended when a massive impact rocked the ship. He's here, Ludlov said. Blessed Zelenheim closed her eyes and mouthed a prayer. Captain Brokohoff joined her, only with a considerably more fearful expression. I will not be cowed by some overgrown snake, Cotignac said drawing his blade. Ad, keep the prisoners here until we have dealt with this beast. <laughs> Ludlov chuckled in disbelief. What are you laughing about, Ivan Adelian? The pirate captain reacted. <laughs> you have no idea what you are facing out there. Go ahead, take to Balbaron. Even your gunfire will be like mosquito bites to it. Katignac ignored him and stormed outside. Ard sighed in exasperation. Good riddance, Tomgard said. Gotiak sometimes has these bouts of foolhardiness, Ard admitted. I think it's an illness or something. I don't understand it. Maybe it's a Goldorian thing. In any case, I am no fool, and I know you have the means to stop Tubalbar. You will help us defeat this thing. Then we will need our gear, Gustav replied. Ad drew his blade and pointed it at Gustav's throat. I have a better idea, he said. You will tell me what item you used to fight it the first time and how to apply it, and I won't kill you. Yet. He pressed the blade just far enough to draw a drop of blood with that last word. Gustav swallowed. He looked more frightened than Ludlov ever remembered seeing him probably because he realized he'd thrown away, dreamed a crossbow, and was thinking of a way to prattle himself out of this situation. All right, I will tell you, he said softly. Outside, the sound of wood breaking and men screaming grew stronger. There wasn't much time to fight back, and if they didn't succeed, Tubalbar would take them all down, friend and foe alike. It's in my backpack. Gustav said defeatedly. Ad eyed him suspiciously, but then slowly took a step backwards, keeping his sword and his gaze pointed at him all the while. Ludlov, standing close by, analyzed the situation, took a deep breath, and decided to take a calculated risk. With Ad's gaze fixed on Gustav, he took the opportunity to act. His hands were bound, but his feet were not, and so he gave Ard's sword hand an upwards kick, causing the Flatlander to lose his blade. Seizing the momentum, Ludlov threw his full weight onto Ard, tumbling down onto the floor on top of him. You idiot! Ard hissed, turning them both over so that he was on top and grasping Ludlov's throat with both hands. The strength of his grip, fueled by anger and fear, was incredibly powerful, and Ludlov couldn't breathe at all. He desperately wanted to push Ard away, but he was powerless since his hands were still bound. All he could see was Ard's furious face, which began to fade as he started to see black spots. Was this the end? It couldn't be. 
he still needed to find the black sickle and avenge Maria. Maria? Would he return to her in the afterlife? Or would he be condemned? He couldn't think anymore and embraced the blackness and the silence that began to set in. Just then, there was a vague echo of shouting and screaming, and his vision returned. Someone was pulling him up by his shoulders. I had a plan, Ludlov, but yours was probably better. It was Gustav holding Ard's weapon, which he used to slice through the ropes binding Ludlov's hands. Did you kill him? Ludlov asked, with what little vocal strength he could muster after almost being strangled to death. Gustav looked down, somewhat ashamed. I couldn't. I'm not a killer, Ludlov. Especially not a killer of my own countrymen, no matter how bad. But I knew a way to knock him out that would keep us safe from him for a while. A little trick I once learned from the Nomaki tribe in Vircasia. A single blow to the neck with my elbow, perfectly timed and directed. Fascinating, Tomgard commented, as Ludlov reached for a dagger that had been stuck into the map on the captain's table. He used it to slice through the ropes, binding his friend's hands. I'm tempted to finish the job for you, Alvarado said to Gustav. But if Tubalbar kills us all, I do not want to face the goddess with murder on my conscience. Perhaps we can lock up Art in here, Blessed Selenheim suggested. That way, he can't hurt us anymore, and we would even be protecting him from Tubalbar. It was a good idea, Ludlov thought. He turned to the door and saw that there was a key resting in the keyhole, which he took out. Meanwhile, the others had already taken their gear, which had been stored in the large chest. Tomgard had even retrieved his hat and was proudly wearing it again. Do you have the cones from the crown? Ludlov asked. Yes, Ludlov, they were here, Gustav replied. I just put the box in my backpack again. Alvarado threw Ludlov's weapon belt in his direction, which he caught and proceeded to put on. What about Chappelle's gear? Tomgard asked. We can't leave it here, but... I will wear her weapon belt, the priestess said. Very well, blessed, Tomgard replied and gave her the belt. It was the first time Ludlov had seen Blessed Zelenheim carry a weapon, and it looked strange to him. All right, now we get out of here before Art wakes up, Gustav said, hunching over under the weight of his ludicrously enormous backpack. He quickly put Federhel's pistol in Ludlov's hand and moved towards the door. Ludlov, holding the key, let the others leave the captain's quarters first. He had to push the bulk of Gustav's backpack through the door. Finally, before he left, he took one last look at Ard lying on the floor. He still wasn't moving. Gustav's elbow blow had been marvelously effective, he quietly admitted. Then he stepped out into the chaos on the deck and locked the door. The sight before him was familiar from Tubalbar's last visit. Parts of the railing were gone. One of the shrouds lay on deck like a big net with pirates underneath, struggling to make their way out like caught fish. Men were firing pistols and rifles to no avail, and there was screaming and shouting everywhere. Brokelhoff stood transfixed on deck, a faraway look on his gaunt face. Just then, a severed leg splattered down in a pool of blood. Looking up, Rudloff saw Tubalba's colossal dark green head, somewhere far above, partly hidden behind the masts and sails of the Teresia. His tendrils were dancing around like whips under the remaining sails. Where his eye used to be, there was now a gaping black hole, which somehow made the beast look even more infernal. Cannons were being fired, causing the beast to look down in annoyance as clouds of smoke rose up on the side of the ship. Then, Ludlov saw Kotinyak in the shrouds of the main mast, firing a pistol at Tubalba's head. It wouldn't help much, but Ludlov had to admire the man's bravery. Gustav set his backpack down and began to rummage around in it. My pouch of herbs, Alvarado said, looking down. You want them? Gustav asked. Here. He put them in the Esclavian's hands, who tucked the pouch under his belt. Suddenly, there was a deep, mighty roar, powerful as a thunderstorm. It towered above the gunfire and the shouts and screams on the ship. Ludlov looked up and saw Tubalba's one good eye looking straight at him. 
and the hatred issuing forth from it was a palpable force, aimed directly and personally at him. He remembers. Then the creature's head bashed into the main mast, breaking it in two. Several men came tumbling down. Kotinyak drew a dagger and jumped onto the sail, sticking the blade through it, making a long tear to slow his descent. Tubalba bit through the ropes of the shroud and threw his head back, flinging helplessly screaming pirates into the cold, dark sea behind him. He was only clearing the way to get to Woodlove. Everyone scattered as the head came down again, bashing into the deck. Ludlov only just managed to roll out of the way as timber burst and flew up. The beast's giant nostrils were right in front of him, hot and putrid breath steaming out of them. Ludlov ran to the steps leading to the quarterdeck as Tobalba's next assault came. Trying to get to Ludlov, the creature bashed its head into the entrance to the captain's quarters, breaking open the door. Ludlov had laid himself flat against the steps, which had barely kept him from being crushed. I can't keep this up forever, he said to Alvarado, who came running towards him as Tubalba raised his head far above once more, pieces of wood stuck in his bleeding snout. On the way, the Ur serpent found a pirate on top of the mizzenmast and plucked him away in his mighty jaw, breaking his spine with a single snap of his teeth. Raising his head, Tubalba let his victim slide down into his throat. Ludlow feared the monster had taken out its frustration on the first victim it could find, but Tubalba's real intention was to swallow down the man who had taken his eye. There was more gunfire now, but it didn't come from the Teresia. There was another ship, behind Tubalba, hailing from Boneyard Bay itself. Many harpoons were being fired at once, ropes tied to them arcing through the night sky. Some of the projectiles bounced off of the creature's scales, but a few of the barbs managed to take hold, especially in the softer flesh of the monster's throat and neck. The distance between the Teresia and the sea serpent increased as the ropes held it back. No one had the strength to control the mighty Tubalba, however. Furious and frustrated, the monster yanked its powerful body, snapping some of the ropes, but others resisted the strain, the barbs of the harpoon sinking deeper, drawing blood. For a moment, it looked like Tubalba could be defeated, but he didn't give up, pulling himself free once more. Even as the barbs of the harpoons rent his skin and scales fell from his bleeding body. Soon, Tubalba was close to the ship again, his silver eyes scanning the deck to find his prey. Ludlov did his best not to despair at the intensity of the monster's determination to kill him and remained near the steps up to the quarterdeck, wondering what to do. For his own safety, he knew he should head below deck, but he didn't want to abandon his friends. Before he could come up with any sort of plan, the Great Serpent had seen him. Ludlov eyed the steps that led below deck, then looked at Alvarado. You should head down, his friend said. By this point, most surviving pirates were either hiding below deck or jumping off board, preferring the long swim to the shores of Esclavia to another encounter with Tubalba leaving the monster's approach mostly unhindered. Ludlov began to move, but Alvarado pulled him back as a colossal barbed tail emerged from the port side of the ship. Tubalba's tail crashed down on top of the deck, blocking the way below. Ludlov considered going up, but then he would be even more exposed to the monster's fury. Then Alvarado shoved the pouch of herbs into his hand. Hold on to this for a while, amigo, he said. For the dinner party in Seven Peaks. Ludlov looked his friend in the eye and saw the same determination he had seen in Tubalba, only fueled by care and friendship instead of hatred. He quickly put the pouch in his breast pocket as he watched Tubalba's head come closer on the starboard side. When Alvarado ran up to the quarterdeck, Ludlov saw that he was carrying a small barrel under his arm. He had no idea what the Esclavian intended to do with that, but suspected it was full of food ingredients he desperately wanted to salvage. Ludlov had no idea where Kotinyak was, and with the door to the captain quarters broken, Ard could easily escape if he regained consciousness. Tuomgard and the priestess stood side by side on deck, near the front of the ship, 
pistols ready. Alvarado took a throwing axe from a fallen pirate and climbed up into the shrouds of the mizzenmast. Gustav took the shoulders of Captain Brokelhoff, who still stood nailed to the deck. When there was no response, the Flatlander made his way toward Tomgard and the priestess. Rudloff wished he could join them, but Tubalba's tail blocked the way. He considered attacking the tail, not because he believed he could do any real damage, but because he thought the only option was to keep the monster focused on him while avoiding its attacks for as long as possible. When Tubalba towered over the Teresia once more and blindly swung his head down to the quarterdeck, Tomgard and Blessed Zelenheim shot their pistols together. One of them managed to hit Tubalba in a spot where he had already been wounded by the harpoons of the other ship, and the creature winced and cried out in pain, but it had seen Rudlov and would not be stopped. The massive snout of the sea serpent crashed down into the quarterdeck, destroying the steering wheel and sending timbers flying in all directions. Ludlov grabbed hold of a rope dangling from the mizzenmast and swung out of the way, across the tail that was still firmly latched onto the deck. He let go of the rope just in time to tumble down onto the main deck. The hollow socket of Tubalba's missing eye reminded him of a dark cave, where some invisible evil spirit lurked, glaring at him. As Tubalba raised his head again, Alvarado hurled his throwing axe at the empty eye socket. The weapon disappeared inside causing little damage, but upsetting the monster greatly. Its attention was now diverted to the Esclavian. Tubalbar hissed angrily, and while he opened his mouth, Alvarado quickly picked up the small barrel and threw it into its mouth. The barrel broke on its teeth and gunpowder spilled onto the deck. Twenty buckets of expired grasshound sauce! Alvarado shouted. He could only just avoid the acid spat in his direction by the infuriated beast. The disgusting substance was damaging the deck a great deal, which caused him to almost trip as he ducked for cover. Tubalba had Ludlov in clear sight again and was viciously aiming his one eye at him, preparing for another wave of corrosive spit. Ludlov tried to hide behind the torn sails, but couldn't avoid a substantial glove ending up on his arm and burning through his shirt and skin with a venomous hiss. Ludlov screamed in pain and dropped down onto the deck. Realizing there was no way he could take a rest, he lifted himself up and hid behind a pile of wrecked timber. As he dragged himself on, he realized Tubalba did not plan on losing him. The great worm's eye remained focused on him without blinking. Ludlov would keep evading the creature for as long as his stamina could hold. Preparing for another roll or jump, he saw Alvarado return with another barrel determination shining in his eyes. Ludlov, take your pistol! Alvarado shouted as he climbed higher up into what remained of the mast. Shoot the barrel when I say so! Bewildered, Ludlov took Federhel's pistol and loaded it, unsure of his friend's intentions. Tubalba's jaws opened wide and his head began to tremble, indicating he was about to spit his acid. Turmgard and Zelenheim were busy reloading their weapons, but they would not be able to shoot in time. Gustav appeared beside Ludlov. What is that Esclavian planning to do? The shopkeeper wondered aloud. Just before the acid attack came, Alvarado shouted down to Ludlov. Have a feast and some wine in my honor, amigo! And don't forget the herbs! Then. Tubalba's venomous bile splattered onto the mizzenmast. To Ludlov's shock, Alvarado avoided the acid by jumping down headfirst towards the deck, holding out the barrel. In a horrific moment, Tubalba's jaws snapped down onto Alvarado's waist. Blood dripped from the monster's chin. His legs stuck in the mouth of the beast, Alvarado still held up the barrel and managed to cry out, Ludlov aimed the pistol, but he shook and fell to his knees in despair as he saw Tubalba raising his head and opening his jaw to let Alvarado slide in. As Ludlov watched, transfixed by sheer horror and grief, the sound of a pistol shot came from behind him. And just as Tubalba's jaw closed down on Alvarado, the barrel exploded. 
colossal monster's head burst open in a feast of fire, flesh, bone and blood. Slabs of meat accompanied by blood and shattered bones rained down onto the deck. As he turned away from the torrent of gore, Ludlow saw Ard grinning and blowing a wisp of smoke away from a pistol. You're welcome, he said with a grin. Overtaken by fury, Ludlow ran after the Flatlander, but Ard disappeared over the side of the ship, just as Tubalba's colossal limp body crashed down onto the deck, right between the broken remains of the main mast and the quarterdeck. The impact was so huge that the Teresia broke in two and the waters of the sea came flowing in as the stern and the aft were raised up high, facing each other. Ludlov couldn't find anything to hold onto and slid down to the middle, onto Tobalba's dead remains. He couldn't see any of his friends and had no chance to search for them as the cold waters came rushing in. He knew he would be pulled down by the suction if he remained where he was, so with his remaining strength, he ran across to Balba's body and jumped out of the way of the dying Teresia. He caught sight of another ship and many smaller boats in the sea, some of them carrying lanterns and torches to light up the night. Ludlov jumped into the water and swam as hard as he could to the nearest boat. The arm of a stranger reached out and pulled him on board the small vessel. It could have been one of the pirates, Ludlov realized, but by the way he was dressed, Ludlov guessed his rescue was an ordinary fisherman, and he nodded his thanks. Then he saw a familiar bulk on the boat, Gustav's backpack. A moment later, he was embraced by the Flatlander. They shared a wordless moment, unable to process what had happened, let alone speak of it. Then they both turned and watched in silence as the Teresia sank beneath the waves. The proud beauty of its golden figurehead momentarily remaining above the water as if she were bidding them her final farewell. Before the shining lady was lost as well to the cold darkness. Thank you for listening to the 10th episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay, A Witch Hunter Tale. These are some of the people supporting us in many ways to keep creating these audio stories. Arno Teva, Jalen Lewis, Caitlin Bredenkamp, Kat Mosiri, Osarion, Ryan Stock, Cody Haidt, Kadir Hussein, Cameron Brantley, Joseph Stowell, Liam Gabriel, Tony Ranico, Peter Strandkrone, Amy Austin, Matt Petain, Yeezy Doucht, Mix and Match. You should really check out the latter's YouTube channel as well, by the way, as the guy mixes and matches stuff. And he posted a mashup of Into the West on our oldest son's birthday that really moved me to tears. Duin has nothing to worry about. There's still so much talent out there that AI can never replace. We want to thank all of the people again who have joined our Patreon community during the past year and a half. Our guardsmen and captains of the guards included. You're awesome and you are the only ones who can show off unique Audio Epics merchandise. Even we don't own the Patreon merchandise. We're a bit jealous, yeah. Travel online to patreon.com slash audioepics if you consider supporting us, or if you're not interested in the extra content and merchandise, or the power to boss us around and just want to listen to the extended edition of the story that is almost an hour longer, you can purchase it on Bandcamp or become our 10,000 subscriber and get it for free. If you're in the mood for it, pay us a visit on Discord to have a friendly chat. Both links are in the description or the pinned comment. We have a shameless promotion channel where you can share your creative work with us if you're an artist. Human or cyborg, we don't discriminate. We hope you return next week for episode 11, 
which will start with the chapter The Rescue. That sounds a bit more uplifting. Allow me to leave you with lots of questions about the story and a d to remind you that it's still a good idea to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell or activate the RSS feed on Podbean. I'll officially end this episode by running the trailer for Counterbalance again. This is a fantasy non-auto-generated audio drama created by the humans behind Blighthouse Studio. Domin plays a part of Tarlos in episode 5, and to support each other's creative work, we agreed to swap trailers. So as I bid you goodnight, you can listen to the trailer of Counterbalance again. Bye bye! Hello, Aurel. Did you want to listen in on me and Rock enjoying ourselves? Don't encourage Should I describe to you what we're doing um, right now? Picasso? <laughs> What's going on? Let's see. Look, these wind shells document anything you do in order to banish the spirits. I don't banish spirits. I'm fixing the tango. Of course, we can't open a new hole into the Aetherweb every year. The spirits aren't always bad. Are Those they? are exactly the reason tango weeds happened in the first Akasar, place. I'm sure Rocka knows how to get through a water gate without disrupting the magic balance. So what happens when there's a hole in the weave? Does magic <laughs> pour out? It is already broken! Let more of air into this world! I'll destroy Wait, no, every single no. one of them! You've had enough already! I will kill you, you filthy Whoa, little... whoa, whoa! Come down, Vaka! Try it, fellow jester! God, ferocious rune master! Your friction will grind the weave a twain! <sighs> Yarta, in moments like these, I wish I could see the runes. What's wrong, Raka? Is that tangle weave maybe too difficult even for someone as great as you? Counterbalance. A high fantasy audio drama. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get podcasts from.